Hello, my friends. Welcome back. And if you're new here, thanks for stopping by. I'm Jim. Today, I'm jumping in to On One Photo Raw 2023 and taking a closer look at the Develop Pane or panel. And this is kind of a beginner's guide, quick start, if you will, for those of you that are new to On One uh, Photo Raw. And uh, in 2023, there's lots of great stuff. I'm trying to walk through some of the key aspects of the product overall, help you get up and running with it. Now, there's a whole lot in the develop pane or develop module that can uh, honestly just do so much to your photo. Uh, I'm obviously not gonna cover all of it in depth. This is a high level design to get you started, give you some pointers, that sort of thing. Let's go ahead and get started. So if you're on develop, uh, there are four basic sections, right? So tone and color. So you can click these to um, collapse or expand them. Tone and color, as the name implies, gives you the ability to control tones and colors. We'll get into that in a minute. Noise and sharpening has a number of different modules, including their AI-based noise reduction and AI-based sharpening slash de-blurring technology. We'll talk about that. There's lens correction, incredibly powerful and useful, and also transform, also incredibly powerful and useful. Now, I would say the, um, the typical approach, and I've done this many, many times, is you got a photo, you jump into tone and color, and you start editing. I actually recommend that you don't do that first. Even though there's four sections and they're stacked, I don't start at the top. I tend to start at the bottom, to be honest, uh, or at the very least at lens correction because you wanna make those lens corrections before you kinda go do any edits. I just think it helps you kinda get your canvas set, which it also means I typically crop most of the time. If I know what kind of crop I'm gonna use, I will do that first. I won't be covering crop in this photo, but click on lens correction and you can see it made a massive difference in the photo. One more time, there it is before and there it is now. So that's a huge help. Now, if you click to expand this, you can see it automatically detected that I shot this with my 24 to 70 on my Sony camera and you can see all that down here. You also have manual controls if you want to come in and either increase or refine that sort of thing. Or for some reason, if it doesn't recognize your lens, uh, you've got massive amounts of choices here to go through and look for and assign that. Uh, based on brand and on lens type. So incredibly important, and I like to make sure that that's on, and I think it's on by default. I'd turn it off prior to this video starting, but one more time, there it is. I mean, massive difference on the photo. Now, the second thing that I like to look at is transform, and you do have to activate that, and what transform does is, kind of as the name implies, it'll transform what I consider the canvas. This is your photo. And kind of, I mean, you can see here, there's different orientation adjustments you can make for horizontal and vertical and all that kind of stuff. And again, I won't cover it all in detail because it's really just too much. It probably deserves its own video, but keystoning lets you fix verticals. I don't really have an issue like that in a landscape, but if you're shooting architecture and you're kind of close and you got a wide angle lens, the buildings look like they're leaning back, Keystoning can help you with that. Vertical, if I adjust that, you can kind of see what's happening here. Uh, so you can make adjustments to the photo. And by the way, anytime you want to reset what you've done in any of these sections, you just hit that little uh, reverse uh, kind of circular arrow thing. Horizontal will do uh, something similar, uh, except on the, uh, the horizontal axis, right? So that can actually kind of help you slightly kind of reframe your photo if you want or need to. Rotation is pretty simple. That's a uh, like straightening. Um, scale will zoom it in, so you could theoretically, it's almost like cropping uh, in terms of the result on the photo, but if I scale that a little bit, that kind of helps me recompose slightly, which kind of looks nice uh, in this case. I'm going to go ahead and reset that, but that's an idea of how you can use that. Aspect ratio will actually uh, kind of squish <laughs> um, or expand your photo, right? So um, generally what happens is, if I need to make adjustments, I will come in and play with all of these to kind of see what happens. Shift will be a left or right, and then uh, rise, as the name implies, will be an up or down. Again, all of these come into play. Typically, what happens for me is I use this on uh, architecture shots for keystoning, and then once I've done uh, the fix those verticals, I'll often need to use these other tools to get the rest of the photo kind of looking the way that it needs to look. Okay, so now noise and sharpening. And I definitely recommend shooting raw files, and that's simply because you just have more data to work with, and I frankly think that you get better results. You can also kind of push the pixels a little bit further, which depending on how you like to edit, but if you want to do particularly a strong edit on a photo, 
having a raw file helps. You've got your classic noise and sharpening section, but then you've got No Noise AI, which is AI-based noise reduction. It's really just fantastic, and I've done videos about it in the past. It came out uh, middle of last year. Tack Sharp AI is the new stuff, so to speak, and uh, that is new in this version. And it's really, as you can see here, it's all about de-blurring the photo, and it includes some micro sharpening. You can see when that just impacted the photo. Now, I tend to find that the micro sharpening is a little heavy handed for me, so I tend to reduce that fairly considerably. But what I wanted to show you is, let me zoom in a little bit more. This is a photo that I shot handheld uh, after climbing uh, up this kind of uh, mountain in Wales. And uh, considering the shape that I'm in, I was probably out of breath, which means if you're breathing heavy and you're taking a photo, you may not have the sharpest photo because there's probably gonna be some micro movements. Um, I didn't really think that there were, but then when you zoom in and you take a look at the photo before, not really the sharpest knife in the uh, in the drawer, as they say, right? So not uh, not particularly sharp. And now, I mean, look at that. It's a massive, massive improvement because of that tack sharp AI de-blurring. Now, if it's a little heavy handed, you can come in and reduce accordingly. And then once you're finished, you just click apply to apply that to the photo. Again, I'm not really editing this photo, so I'm not going to do that but I recommend checking that stuff out first because what it may um, keep you from doing is applying like in the effects tab or in local adjustments, other things that might either accentuate or just not look good if you haven't properly, properly uh, de-blurred the photo to start with. So very powerful, super useful, and I think great to do before you get started. Also the same in the case of no noise or noise reduction, get that done before you go edit your photo, because otherwise you may just end up accentuating the noise that's there and things like that. And of course the tab here allows you to do both the noise reduction and the uh, tack sharp deblurring at the same time on the image. So I'm gonna hit reset and get back to my main screen and that's that section. So again, lens correction I'm pretty sure is on by default, but I, I do that, make sure that's on. If I need to, I do transform, I do noise and sharpening, and then I get into tone and color. Like I said, your desire might be jump in, let's start editing, but I tend to prefer to take it slow, kind of get my canvas set before I go in and start making edits. Now this is kind of where the fun begins. The other stuff is kind of like, I hate to say administrative, but getting the canvas in place, getting noise removed, getting de-blurring applied so that your photo is actually sharp as opposed to kind of blurry, all that stuff is like the administrative stuff you gotta do. And then you start getting into fun in tone and color but this is, uh, these are global adjustments. Masking does not apply here because these are applying across the entire photo by default. So I always start here. It's, it's quite fun and there's a lot of great things in effects and there's a lot you can do in local adjustments, but I highly recommend that you start and develop, do that first. Again, this is kind of, it's still kind of to me in the category of getting your canvas set, but get all that together, get organized, get your base photo done, and then go to effects and local adjustments and things like that. So. Um, lots of different sections here. Again, high level. Uh, camera profiles. The on one standard profile is honestly fine with me, but camera profiles basically interpret the raw data. So as I hover over these different things uh, or different profiles, you can see that it does impact the overall look of the photo and how that raw photo data is interpreted. And to be clear, these profiles only apply on raw files, not on JPEGs or anything like that. And there's some other ones down here. I, you can also import your own, by the way. I tend to leave it on standard simply because it's kind of a habit. There's probably people that are super technical about this and have really legitimate technical reasons why you should use a camera profile. I just don't really use them. Um, I tend to edit kind of by feel. Once you get into this editing section, there's tone and then there's color, as you can see down below. Uh, there's three different tabs here, manual, AI match, and AI auto. Manual, as the name implies, is me coming in and moving all these sliders to make the photo look the way I want the photo to look. AI match is basically trying to match the photo to what it looked like on the back of your camera. That looks pretty good, to be honest. So if you do a backslash key, there's before, and that also removes the lens correction. Uh, and there's the current state. You can see the tones are a little bit better. It looks a little bit nicer. Uh, and then, of course, reset if I want to. Uh, and then AI auto is basically using an AI algorithm to sort of make a best guess at what to do. Sometimes I like this, sometimes I don't. In this case, I think it's overdone, so I don't really like that. Uh, it's a little bit better like in a couple of areas, but like this foreground's way too green, yellow, and vibrant and all that. And you can see all the adjustments that have happened to the photo as a result of this change. Now, once you come in here and start moving things, you will note that it switches to manual. 
because I'm now making manual adjustments. So even though I started with AI Auto, once I come in here and start making adjustments, it switches itself to manual because I'm basically taking control. And in this case, I would say, you know, hey, I need to cool it off a little bit, maybe adjust temperature, maybe pull down vibrance, you know, saturation, I don't know. Again, don't really have a plan for this particular photo, but the point is you have the ability to come in and either let the product kind of or the program kind of figure things out for you. I kind of like that AI match. I think that looks like pretty good starting point. Or you can just come in full manual. I tend to do full manual, but sometimes I'll click on these uh, these buttons and just check it out. Uh, let's say I've got this AI match and I like that. There is one thing I want to point out, and that is uh, if you hit the J key, at least on a Mac, I don't know if it's the same on a PC, but if you hit the J key and hold it down, you can see it will show you areas that are completely blown out. They show up in red which means the highlights are just blown. Um, and areas that are completely black will show up in, in a blue overlay. I don't see any of that here, but this is a great thing to do to help you kind of control the highlights. So uh, hold down the J key, you can see where things are blown out. And I'm gonna pull these highlights down because that doesn't look good. As you start to pull them down, continuing to hold the J key, you can see that they are going away. And then once they fully disappear, I generally stop. And now my highlights look a whole lot better. So that's an idea for editing to kind of give you better control over the overall tones in your image. And you can see the before, and you can see that sky was kind of blown out. And now I think the sky looks pretty good. Uh, and I think overall, this is a pretty good looking base file. It's got the lens correction applied. I didn't really need transform. I, I would use the de-blurring on this photo, although I just didn't in this example. Um, and then the stuff I've done in tone and color so far, I think look pretty good. This is where I'd say, okay, now I wanna kinda customize or stylize the photo, and that's where I would go over to effects and local adjustments. I'm not finished with the photo. Let's say I'm good here, and, and this area is you know, very common in editing programs, just like the develop pane in Lightroom, you know, contrast, highlights, midtones, whites, blacks, all that. You've also got structure and haze, uh, and then the color section down here gives you the ability to go in with a dropper and pick uh, an area that you consider kind of a neutral gray and apply basically a temperature or tint uh, shift. I tend to do all this stuff by myself. I just kind of prefer to drag these sliders in order to get the look that I want. That's simply because I'm just habitually someone who kind of takes control over what I do and I know what I want to end up having the photo look like. So I kind of use my eye. And so I use these sliders, but you can, uh, you've got on raw files, you've got various um, options here in terms of adjusting this overall white balance. And as you hover over them, you can see a preview on the screen. I just leave it as as shot. There's also auto. You could click that and it'll make an adjustment to whatever it feels is appropriate. But I'm going to turn that off. You may notice that some of these sliders down here, temperature 10, etc., change auto off when I, when I click that so that auto is on. This is kind of confusing sounding. But when auto is on, you can see that the numbers are at a certain set setting. And then when I turn auto back off, you can see that they adjust. I, like I said, I tend not to use that. I would probably go a little bit bluer, maybe a little bit vibrant here, but not too much. I wouldn't do a whole lot color-wise. I would just kind of leave the image about like that, and then I would say, hey, time to go have some fun in effects, or I can take advantage of all these amazing masking tools like Super Select AI, Mask AI, and all the different effects tools themselves to apply dynamic contrast or HDR look or some smoothing or some glow or whatever it might be. And there's also a nice section down here if you are editing a portrait where you can reduce the vibrance on the skin. It basically examines skin tone colored areas of the photo and doesn't impact the vibrance there. That way, if you are editing a portrait, you're not gonna get an overdone kind of color look on somebody's skin. So that is kind of a high level. I mean, we didn't do a whole lot to this photo, but you can see we started like that and you add in the lens correction, some of the basic things that we did in develop. And I think I've got a really good starting point before I wanna go do my kind of creative stuff, which is really what the other tabs are for. Effects, um, if you're not familiar with this, you've got all these different filters you can apply and come in and apply them either based on different masking or you can apply them globally to the entire photo. Sky is for sky replacement and it's done a really good job. Uh, it gets better and better over time. I think it's a very solid offering. Portrait, of course, for portraits and local adjustments, of course, are designed to be uh, it's essentially, let me just show you, if you're not familiar with this, this is kind of like having uh, this color and tone section over here. If you look at it with uh, the tone and uh, the color and all that, 
structure haze, things like that. It's kind of close over here on local adjustments. It's basically like the same kind of thing. So it's a way to come in and do some localized adjustments using sliders that uh, mimic what's over in develop. But anyway, today's lesson was all about develop. Hope that gives you a good idea of how to get started with On One Photo Raw 2023. That is definitely the pain that I would start in. It's tempting to jump into effects, or, uh, especially effects, but maybe even local adjustments or sky replacement. But I recommend get your raw file, get your base canvas set, get your base edits done to your raw file, sharpening, noise, whatever it may be, uh, along with the tone and color adjustments, and then go have fun. So that's it for this one. I'll be back soon with more on one beginner guides. I hope this has given you a, a good preview of how you can quickly get started editing and having a you know, beautiful impact on your photos. If you've enjoyed this video, check out that on one video. I'll be back really soon, my friends. Thanks for watching. I appreciate it. You guys take care. And until next time, adios.